The next portion of the digestive system we'll discuss are the intestines. The small intestine and the large intestine. The anatomy of the small intestine. At the pyloric region of the stomach begins the small intestine. Let's use this diagram to show its anatomy relative to other organs in the abdominal cavity, the stomach and the liver. The small intestine is adjacent to the large intestine, which is divided into three main regions, the ascending colon, the transverse colon, and the descending colon. At the end of the digestive system is the rectum and anus. The small intestine is approximately 6 meters or 20 feet in length. And even though it's called the small intestine, it's longer but not as wide as the large intestine. The majority of the nutrient absorption takes place in the small intestine. And the small intestine, because of its length, occupies most of the peritoneal cavity. The small intestine is connected to the pylorus of the stomach. Now that we've discussed the gross anatomy of the small intestine, let's look at the histology. Within the small intestine are plicae. Each plica increases the surface area for absorption in the small intestine. These plica do not change shape as the small intestine is filled, unlike those of the stomach. Within the mucosa of the small intestine are special villi and crypts. Each villi has a network of capillaries and lymphatics into which the absorbed substances are delivered. Shown on the right side of the slide is a diagram of a villi, goblet cell, and intestinal crypt. The crypts secrete enzymes such as sucrase and maltase. These enzymes are necessary for the digestion of macronutrients into micronutrients. The regions of the small intestine. This anterior and posterior view of the abdominal cavity reveal the location of the small intestine. In the posterior view, you can see the duodenum where it connects to the stomach. In the anterior view is the second portion, the jejunum. And in the posterior view is the ileum where it connects to the cecum and large intestine. The duodenum is the first segment and it's attached with the pyloric sphincter of the stomach. And therefore, the addition of pancreatic enzymes in this region is the main mixing portion. After a bend in the duodenum, the jejunum begins. This region is much longer, approximately 2.5 meters or 8 feet. And this is where the majority of digestion and nutrient absorption takes place. The jejunum and ileum make up the majority of the length of the small intestine. The ileum is approximately 3.5 meters or 12 feet long, and it ends at the ileocecal valve through which material enters the cecum of the large intestine. The support and regulation of the small intestine. Shown in the diagram on the left is the superior mesenteric vein and the superior mesenteric artery. These are the major blood supply to this region of the digestive system. The small intestine has the following associated vasculature, the superior mesenteric artery and the superior mesenteric vein. These vessels, along with sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation, pass through the support of mesentery known as the mesentery proper. The first division of the small intestine, the duodenum, has no support of mesentery. This is a very small region you'll remember from the previous slide. The myenteric plexus and submucosal plexus control the movement of food material through the small intestine. And parasympathetic or vagal stimulation triggers the release of secretions which are inhibited by the sympathetic stimulation to this region. After the small intestine within the digestive system is the large intestine. Now let's look at the anatomy of the large intestine. 
highlighted in blue font on the diagram, are the three major regions of the large intestine. The ascending colon, the transverse colon, and the descending colon. The large intestine runs from the ileum of the small intestine to the rectum and anus. It's also called the large bowel. It's approximately 1.5 meters or 5 feet long and is so named because it's wider 7.5 centimeters than the small intestine. The major functions of the large intestine include the reabsorption of water, the absorption of locally made vitamins, and the storage of fecal material before defecation. The inferior mesenteric artery supplies the large intestine with blood. The large intestine moves its contents slowly, including mass movements that occur only a few times in a day. Let's look at the regions of the large intestine in more detail. Towards the center of this diagram is the ileum, the last portion of the small intestine. It joins the large intestine at the cecum. Just underneath the cecum is the appendix. The cecum gives way to the ascending colon, which rises until the right colic hepatic flexure. Next, the large intestine turns and becomes a transverse colon. This travels across to the left colic splenic flexure, where it turns on itself and descends as a descending colon. Also labeled in the diagram are the hostra. Next, the sigmoid colon turns to join the rectum at the end of the digestive system. The large intestine is made up of the cecum and the colon. The cecum is where the small intestine attaches. The cecum begins the process of compaction. The appendix is attached to the postural medial surface of the cecum. Lymphoid nodules are present on the mucosa and submucosa of the appendix, and it functions as part of the lymphoid system, similarly to the tonsils. The colon has unique pouches known as haustra, and these pouches permit distension and elongation of the colon. There are longitudinal ribbons of smooth muscle below the serosa on the outside of the colon. The first portion of the colon is the ascending colon, and it travels upward along the right abdominal wall region. It turns left at the liver at the right colic or hepatic flexure. This is the end of the ascending colon and the beginning of the transverse colon. The transverse colon is the longest and most mobile portion of the colon. It travels across the abdomen until it becomes retroperitoneal and turns with a right angled bend at the left colic or splenic flexure. The next portion of the colon is the descending colon, which travels down the left side of the abdomen. It's secondarily retroperitoneal and therefore is attached to the abdominal wall. It's behind coils of the small intestine. After the descending colon is the sigmoid colon, and when the colon enters an S-shaped segment, the sigmoid colon begins. This section of the colon is approximately 15 centimeters long. It passes transversely across the front of the sacrum to the right side of the pelvis. It then curves towards the middle and turns downward and ends at the rectum. Here's a clinical note in which we'll discuss diverticulitis. Diverticulitis involves the formation of diverticula. These are sac-like pouches of the wall of the colon. Patients usually have gastrointestinal problems such as diarrhea, nausea, constipation, and abdominal pain. This most frequently occurs in the sigmoid colon, and it's accompanied by an increased intraluminal pressure and in some cases infection. The cause of diverticulitis is believed to be poor diet, lack of indigestible fiber, and an increase in constipation. Treatment includes clearing any infection, the use of anti-inflammatory drugs, 
and gradually increasing the amount of high fiber foods in the diet. The last segment of the digestive system is the rectum. Shown the diagram, the sigmoid colon turns and forms the rectum. At the end of the rectum is the anus. Surrounding the anus is the anal sphincter, as well as anal columns. The rectum itself is the last 15 centimeters of the digestive tract, into which the sigmoid colon discharges. The rectum temporarily stores fecal material, and this triggers defecation. The anal canal ends at the anus in the region of the anal sphincter. The anal sphincter is made up of an internal portion and an external portion. And a ring of skeletal muscle fibers at the anal sphincter is under voluntary control. In this last section we'll review the histology of the large intestine. Shown in the diagram in the bottom left corner is a section of large intestine. Goblet cells and intestinal crypt cells are in the mucosa. Underneath that is the muscularis mucosa, the submucosa, and the muscularis externa, which is the muscle layer. Unlike the small intestine, the large intestine has no villi. There are more goblet cells in this region. The crypts and glands are larger and deeper in the large intestine. The muscularis externa is also different. The muscle layer is not under the serosa, but rather it's in bands on the outside surface.